All right. Welcome to the National Exam Prep. And today what we're going to do is we are going to dive into contracts, general principles of agency, and the practice of real estate. And on your national exam, these three account for over 30% of uh, the, the information that you're going to be getting quizzed over. And so we are going to dive into some of the concepts. We're not going to truly look at the, the questions per se, but more look into, you know, definitions, what we should be looking out for so that when we are presented a question, we're not like hunting the, we're not trying to remember and hunt down the, the exact question more. So we just want to make sure that we understand what the verbiage looks like. So when we are presented it, um, it's a little bit easier for us. So we're going to start with contracts. And again, this is the national side. And yes, I'll, some of these pieces will correlate back and forth, like to where uh, we're in Colorado. And so they will touch some of the Colorado pieces. And so contracts, the very basic premise of a contract is it's written or oral. And it's to either do something or to not do something. So again, a contract can either be written or oral. And it's either say, I will do this or I won't do this. And so when we start thinking about contracts, we have these essentials of what a valid contract is. And so firstly, we need to have capable parties. And to be a capable party, the person must be of legal capacity to contract, right? So we're talking about 18 years of age or older and of sound mind. The second thing that we think of is lawful object. And a contract must be entered into for legal purposes. And most contracts, right, when we're starting thinking about real estate specifically, they are for a legal purpose as far as a house goes. But if I am trying to create a contract to give away my house so that um, I can escape past um, like an RIRS or maybe a lawsuit, then it's no longer for a lawful object, right? So really this is legal purpose, not necessarily thinking about the house, but thinking about why I am selling the house or contracting to give my house away maybe. Consideration. And this is where this, this lawful object comes into play. Normally when we think about consideration, it's about money, but consideration could be anything of value. And consideration could even be for love and affection. And so that's when this legal purpose comes into play. Like if maybe I'm being sued by someone and they are going to potentially be able to take my house from me and some of my assets, and I want to write a contract to someone in my family and all they have to do is give me love and affection, right? They're like, Charles, I will, I'll love you forever, you know, if, if you give me this house, right? And I put the house in their name for this type of consideration so that when I'm getting sued, the other person can't take my property, then I no longer have a legal purpose and the contract would be void at that point. And then offer an acceptance. And offer an acceptance is also called mutual consent or meeting of the mind. So as you're going through and they're talking about offering acceptance, mutual consent, or meeting of the mind, those all mean the same thing. And if a contract is with an illegal purpose, it is automatically void. So again, like I'm trying to get rid of my property so that whatever, so no one can take it from me, that is illegal and the contract is void at that point. One of the things that we need to keep in mind is this OR versus EE, right? And when we start thinking about this, specifically when we're talking about contracts, this is the offerer and offeree. And the offer is the person in the party who initiates the offer, while the offeree is the person who's receiving it, right? And so we typically think of this as the buyer is the offerer and the seller is the offeree because they are receiving it. So that's truly how most of these happen. Yes, the, the seller is putting the home on the market and they are marketing it for sale, but they're not offering, right? The offerer is the buyer. And then when we start thinking about counter offers, a counter offer is when maybe I put something in as the buyer 
and I offer to buy someone's home and they don't like my terms. Well, then they do a counter and now the seller becomes the offerer and the buyer becomes the offeree. Now, with that being said, the original offer is no longer in play. So if someone counters, the original offer is off the table. It no longer exists. This is a brand new contract now. So if the seller offers to the buyer new terms and the buyer doesn't want to accept it, the buyer just wouldn't sign the new counter offer, the new offer. Same thing on the reverse side. If the seller who originally gets the first offer, so I'm the buyer again, I offer to the seller and they don't like my terms. They do not sign the original offer. The parties only sign the offer that they are both okay with. If you sign an offer and it is not the terms that you're wanting and we have both parties, that's mutual assent, right? At both parties, we have agreements and now we have a contract that is valid, right? So we want to make sure that we are not signing any offers unless we accept them. So the counter offer creates a completely new one and we can go back and forth. If the buyer, right, I offer to the seller, the seller doesn't like it, they counter and I don't like their new terms, I can counter back and we can just keep going back and forth. And then when we both like the, the, the offer that we have now created, we both sign it and now we have a valid contract. So then when we start thinking about these contracts, right, some of the big things is void, valid and voidable. And when we go through, a void contract is not an actual contract and it's 100% unenforceable, right? Again, when we think of it's for an illegal intent or something along those terms, contract is void. A valid contract, right? This is legally binding. It's enforceable in the court of law. And that's where we typically think of like a contract to buy and sell, right? Both parties have signed on it and there is everything's above board. And now we have a valid contract. Avoidable contract is a valid and enforceable contract, but there's some kind of flaw, right? Which will make it void. And so when we think about this, we think about contracts involving minors, right? So a, a minor can just walk away from a contract. And I, I talked about Justin Bieber, right? And that's a, such an old and dated uh, analogy because Justin Bieber's, you know, in his 20s, if not 30s now. And back when he was a minor and he was making a lot of money doing, you know, singing and, and doing the songs and, and everything like that, he had enough money to buy any house that he really wanted to. Well, his age at any point in the transaction could have walked away from the transaction and it would not have been enforceable. Contracts that we tricked or forced the party into doing something and contracts involving an incapacitated party at the time of signing, incapacity including being drunk, delusional, or insane, right? So these are make it voidable. They all look good in the beginning, but then somewhere along the line, we realize that one of these things is actually in play. And it takes this seemingly valid contract. And now it's a voidable contract, which now makes it a void contract. All right. So think about voidable and definitely lean on a minor, someone under 18 years of age, because that's what I truly think that you're going to see on your exam. One of the other things under contracts that we have to keep in mind is this electronic and paperless transaction. And you're going to see a question around this. And it's really around e-sign, right? The electronic signatures in global and national commerce, which is really just saying electronic, uh, electronic contracts are just as good as a paper contract, right? When we start thinking about sign on the dotted line or before the ink is dry or wet uh, signature, right? Where we're going through and we're actually putting on paper, a, a paper contract and an electronic contract hold the exact same weight. And so as we're going through, you can absolutely send an electronic contract and it will go through and it will be just as enforceable as a contract that you actually went through and had someone sign up. For the most part, 
every contract that we do in the United States when real estate is involved is electronic these days. Every once in a while, you will land on a contract where you're doing some wet signatures and you can bind those together as well. Like you could have a party doing wet signatures and a party doing electronic signatures. And both of those contracts can be joined together and be a fully enforceable contract. One of the big things that we need to keep in mind for this contract as well is bilateral versus unilateral contracts and specifically like an option. And a bilateral contract, right? Both parties have a promise or a promise, which means that they are both going to agree to perform certain actions. And we like to think about the contract to buy and sell. So sales contracts um, are common examples of bilateral contracts. And so the seller says, that they will go through and sell the home to the buyer if the buyer goes through and brings money to the deal, right? Or if we're thinking about a listing contract, it says that the seller promises to compensate the agent if the agent procures a buyer. That is a bilateral contract. If I do something, will you do something bilateral? Then we think about a unilateral contract. And this is a one-sided agreement where only one of the parties make a promise to perform. And I think your test question is going to be around an option agreement to where you're going to get a test question that says, give me an example of a unilateral contract. And so an option contract is an agreement between a buyer and a seller. Okay, it's between a buyer and a seller where the seller offers the buyer the option to purchase their property. And we say it's at X amount of dollars within some kind of time frame. It doesn't matter what the time frame is, but there is some time, type of time frame. Buyer's not legally obligated to go purchase the property. All right, they have the option to, but they never, ever, ever have to go get this money to purchase the property. Also, under the option contract, the seller must wait for the buyer. So if we gave the buyer 30 days, the seller has to wait 30 days. Now the buyer at the end of 30 days can be like, you know what? I actually don't want the property. And the the, the it just comes to terms. The seller cannot sell it to anyone during those 30 days. And the seller is free to offer the property to other potential buyers after that, that time window. So in this case, we said 30 days. 30 days goes by, the buyer didn't perform, didn't bring the money, and now the seller is allowed to go and sell the property to somebody else. So when you're thinking of this, bilateral versus unilateral, two parties have to perform, promise for promise. Unilateral, only one party has to perform. And I truly believe that the test question is going to ask you is going to be around an option agreement. You're also going to get some questions around amendments versus addendums. And so an amendment is just a modification to an original contract. All right. And so this could be something where maybe we started off where the price was 550 and now we're dropping it down to 525. Or maybe we said that we we're going to have a date and deadline for whatever date, but we realize that that date is coming close. We haven't been able to do what we needed to do to hit that deadline. And we extend the deadline like three days. Both of these are a deviation from the initial agreement. All right. So when we start thinking about an amendment, I want you to think of a modification or a deviation from the initial agreement. Then we have an addendum. And this is something that is getting added into an existing contract. And it says like, maybe you were writing the contract and the contract didn't say that the kitchen appliances were coming with the property. Well, the seller meant for the kitchen appliances to come with the property. Like they don't want to take them to their new place and they don't want to have a yard sale to get rid of them. So you both parties get to an agreement and they write this addendum stating that they already have a contract in place, but the appliances were left out and we want the appliances to go with the original contract. All right, so an amendment is just a slight change. 
right? Like removing the dollar amount. Like we already have a dollar amount, but we're changing the dollar amount. Or we have dates and deadlines, but we're changing the dates and deadlines. An addendum is we are changing the contract, right? Like the contract never anywhere mentioned kitchen appliances in it. We are now inserting kitchen appliances because, well, again, the seller doesn't want to have a yard sale and sell the appliances. They'd rather just go with the house and be one less headache. I mean, they're already buying a new house, selling their house and moving their furniture. They don't want an additional thing going on in their world. You're definitely going to get questions around contingencies. And so a contingency is really just like, I intend to buy your house dependent upon this meeting my soul and subjective discretion, whether I like it or not. Like that's really what it is. And so like I say, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, and I'm the buyer, I want to purchase your house contingent upon me being able to go get a mortgage. Like I need to have the money. Like I can't afford to buy your house. I need to be able to go get a mortgage. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I intend on buying your house dependent on the title work being clear equitable and marketable title same on right home inspection like depending on the home inspection depending on me being able to sell my house like i have to sell my current home to be able to afford to buy your home contingent upon the appraisal meeting like i'm offering you five hundred thousand dollars for your home your home has to appraise for at least five hundred thousand dollars for the bank to give me that money if your home appraises for only four hundred and fifty thousand dollars I can't buy your house as well as homeowner insurance. So you could see a question around any six of these. And basically all it means is that it, it has to be in place to where I put these deadlines in to the contract. And if one of these things doesn't meet uh, my expectations, I do not have to buy the house. Also, with that being said, what this means is the buyer gets their earnest money back. For the most part, all these real estate contracts, they protect the buyer. And so these contingencies, while they do have some to protect the sellers, for the most part, that's around seller financing. Most contingencies in a contract are to protect buyers. And so as we're going through and we're thinking about this, guys, I need you to just keep this in mind that contingencies protect the buyer. And with that, if we make an objection and we send a written objection to the seller to terminate and we are on or before our contingency date and deadline, the earnest money gets returned back to the buyer. So, for example, home inspection. My home inspection is due tomorrow and I have the home inspection and I don't like something, right? Like I go through and maybe there's a sewer issue, uh, HVAC issue. Maybe there's a, a crack in a foundation. I don't want to buy the home anymore. I send a written termination to the seller stating, you know, that I, I don't want to be in the contract anymore because of this home inspection didn't look the way that I expected it to look. The seller has to give me my earnest money back. The contract ends. Both parties get return to a neutral position like the contract never even happened at real estate contingencies you will get a couple questions around this it says when a buyer fails to fulfill the term of a real estate contract the seller is entitled to keep their earnest money all right so now we're doing the opposite all right so like let's say that i put this earnest money in place right? Because that's how we're doing a lot of this stuff. I put earnest money in place and the, I didn't perform and I try to walk away. The seller actually does get to keep my earnest money. But if I'm going through and I have this contingency and that is the reason why I am walking away, I'm allowed to walk away and get my earnest money returned. One of the other things that you're going to get... Oh, is you're going to get um, questions around counter offers and multiple offers. All right. And so a counter offer, we just talked about the counter offer going back and forth between the seller and the buyer, the offerer who is the buyer, 
the offeree, who is the seller. The seller doesn't like the terms. They counter. It goes back and forth however many times both parties can reject it. They can walk away. And every time that a counter is put in place, that is the new offer and the other one falls off the table. You don't go back to that one. The other thing is multiple offers. And we just came out of an, a time frame and environment where the market had a lot of multiple offer situations. And while we're still seeing it today, it's not as prevalent as it used to be. And so some of the things that we have to keep in mind is that agents must present all offers, all right? So this could be an offer from your brokerage. This could be um, an offer from a client, or I'm sorry, from another customer after you have presented the other offers, right? So let's say that you're under contract and an offer comes in you are still obligated to present that to your client or the date, the, the deadline passed for all offers. Uh, still the offer comes in, you still must present. So an agent must present all offers. If you go in with that mentality, it doesn't matter when or where the offer came from, you still must present it. On the other hand, you are not obligated to go get more offers after your client is under contract, all right? so. If offer comes in, yes, you, you have to let your client know. And with that being said, you are not obligated to go get and go find your client more money by go, go procuring more offers for them, all right? So you must present them all, but once you're under contract, you don't need to keep doing open houses and marketing and doing all these things to get more offers in. So I'll switch over to general principles of agency. We have three different types of agency. We have a special agent. This is an agent that's just doing one specific task. This is someone that might be what we think of ourselves, right? Like I might be a buyer's agent helping someone go buy a home. I might be a seller's agent helping someone sell a home. That's my job special agent. A general agent is an agent that is doing like an ongoing task or a variety of tasks within like a certain arena. And I want you to think of like a property manager, right? A property manager is a general agent who is maybe calling for the property to be fixed when something happens. They're collecting uh, deposits. They are collecting rental checks. That's general agency. And then when we talk about universal agent, I want you to think of POA, power of attorney. All right. This is someone that pretty much can do anything and everything for their client, including like sign their name on a contract. Like if I were to give a client universal agency, what this means is that if I said, hey, find me a property that's going to cash flow X amount of dollars in this area and the client or the agent finds it for me, they can sign my name and attach me to a contract because I gave them this, which would mean that they also have to have POA. Like I actually have to sign a document giving them power of attorney. It would be limited. Like it would only be in the real estate arena. Like they couldn't go sell my house or sell my car or have like uh, health around me or anything like that. Like this is really just this specific thing I do in POA to go buy houses for me. So special agency, general agency, and universal agency are three different types of agencies that you will need to know. Real estate brokerage relationships. So obviously, like the first two, I feel like we're we're pretty good there, right? Like a seller's agent and a buyer's agent owe that, right? So if I'm working for the seller, I owe this to the seller. If I'm working for the buyer, I owe this for the, the buyer. We're talking about utmost good faith, loyalty, and fidelity. Like I owe these three things, utmost good faith, loyalty and fidelity if i'm working as an agent right i am working for my principal my client all right as an agent these are agency relationships we also have transaction broker and they're working for the transaction 
All right. This is someone that is not advocating for either party. All right. Like you're providing communications. You are someone's telling you and you are going through and negotiating, right? You're not on, negotiating on behalf, but if someone says, no, I want you to do this for me, like you're relaying that negotiating, you're doing the contracting and you're doing the closing, right? For both parties and you don't advocate or represent either one, you're representing the transaction. You are getting the transaction to the finish line. And then we have dual agency. And so for the national exam, dual agency is legal. And what we have to know is that disclosure must be presented to both the buyer and the seller. So you must give disclosure and they must agree to this. And just because, right, we just need to know that Colorado, it's illegal. Like we do not have dual agency. I know we're talking about national right now. But in Colorado, it is illegal to represent both parties. Transaction broker and dual agency are not the same thing, right? Transaction broker, I represent the transaction. Dual agency, I represent both parties. As long as I disclose to them, I'm doing it and they both agree to it. So again, right, like as we're, we're going to hit this thing home because agency is, is very important. Like I said, these three topics, these amount for more than 30% of your exam. Um, so an agent is an individual hired by a principal to act on their behalf and to represent their interest, right? Like as long as I'm not doing anything illegal or they don't ask me to do anything legal, like I am doing everything for them to help them win. Like that is my job is to make sure my client my principal wins. Agency is the relationship between the two, the two parties, right? Where the principal or the client hires me, the agent, to represent them. And this fiduciary, right? This is what we owe a principal. We don't owe fiduciary responsibility to a transaction broker uh, or in a transaction brokerage relationship. We don't owe fiduciary to a customer. So this is trust, loyalty, uh, confidentiality, care, and due diligence, all right? These are our fiduciary responsibilities that we give as an agent to our client or our principal. We don't have these in a transaction brokerage relationship, and we do not have these for a customer. So as we're talking about this agency, right, we, we got to talk about agency relationships, and there's two different types of agency relationships that we have. One's express, right? That's either oral or written, right? Like we either verbally or we put it in writing that we are going to work together. And it says, right, that while the validity of an oral uh, uh, agreement is in establishing agency varies by state to state, a written agreement such as a listing or buyer's agency agreement is the safest and most appropriate way to create an agency relationship. So again, but we're talking about the national exam now. So we know that we can have an oral agreement and we know that the statute of frauds and with other things that are in place, the better way to go is for it to be in writing. Implied agency, on the other hand, right? This is through our actions. And this example says, right, a real estate agent engages with a homeowner who's selling their property privately. So let's think of a for sale by owner, right? Someone that's putting it up on, on Zillow saying, this is my house and it's for sale. And the agent, myself, I'm bringing a potential buyer to the property. Both parties may be considered to have established an implied agency relationship, right? Because now the seller, I'm bringing them a buyer. They might think that I'm working for them. And now if they think that I'm working for them, right, and I owe them all of those things for fiduciary responsibility because how I am bringing them a buyer, now the court might get involved because I wasn't really working for the seller. I was working for my buyer and I wanted my buyer to win. But then the seller thought because I was finding them so on and that I was working and, and helping them through the transaction, right, giving them paperwork and whatever they told me, I brought it back to the buyer. Well, now the court might get involved. And now the court is going to settle any dispute that might uh, happen because of this thing. So that's why we do a lot of things with uh, agency relationship disclosures.
And here it is, right? So here's your brokerage relationship disclosures. So the definition of a working relation form is not a disclosure to begin with, right? This is a form that is only required when a party inquires about a brokerage relationship that's not offered. So if I am representing the seller as an agent and someone comes in and starts asking me information, I have to hit them with this working relationship because they need to know that I'm not their agent. Like I can't offer them like advice and I cannot be a fiduciary for them. So I have to give this paperwork. It is a resource to provide a consumer when they ask about different brokerage relationships. Awesome. So if like someone's like, hey, can you represent me as a customer or can you help me as a transaction broker or whatever that looks like? This is also a piece of paper that I would hand to them. The brokerage disclosure must be in writing. This cannot be something that's written or I'm sorry, it cannot be something that's verbal. Like I must have the actual uh, approved form that is a brokerage relationship disclosure and I must hand it to them. Part of the test question, right, is that it must be at the earliest reasonable opportunity before they and start giving me confidential information, all right? So if someone walks in to an open house and I represent the seller, and someone starts telling me, oh my God, I love this house. I actually need to move here. I'm about to be kicked out of my house and I would do anything to buy this. And I'd probably go $100,000 over asking. And if I accepted all that information without stopping them and be like, whoa, 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 pump the brakes. Let's land the plane real quick. Brokerage relationship disclosure. I actually work for the seller. Anything that you say will be used against you. I will be in a lot of trouble if that doesn't happen, guys. And so this must be made immediately before they tell us any of their motivations on why they're moving or what their financial qualifications look like. We need to go through that and know that if the customer doesn't want to sign, right? Because this is truly around like customers. If the customer doesn't want to sign, we actually have to note that and give them a copy and then keep a copy for ourselves. And a big thing to remember on this is the change of status. All right. So let's say, right, I work for a buyer and I work for a seller, right? Two different parties, two totally different transactions. Well, now my buyer sees my seller's property and they want to write an offer on it. Now what I have to do is I have to let both parties know that, hey, I work for the buyer, I work for the seller, and I can represent the transaction as a transaction broker. And I would do a change of status immediately if they did want to proceed, right? And if I was able to do that, right? And there would be a box check to my agency agreement, which would say, Charles, are you allowed to do this? But that's one of the things. So a change of status form happens immediately when the, the, the change is happening. And I really think about it like when I'm agent for both and I'm dropping down for TV for the transaction, when my buyer and my seller want to do a deal together, that's when this change of status form happens. And it also must be in writing and it has to be on a commission approved change of status form. So this is the information that I need to know for brokerage relationship disclosures, like all of these bullet points. When we're going through guys, and we've been talking about fiduciary duties a lot, right? And this is that AC cold, right? And I don't have it written the AC cold way, but this is what it looks like. So firstly, it's accounting. I have to know where all my clients' money is, right? Like at all times, I gotta know where it is and I can't combine my money and their money together, right? That's against the law, it's called commingling. Uh, we cannot commingle money. Care, right? I have to use like my expertise, all my skills on the behalf of my client. Like that is care. Confidentiality, this thing goes two ways. And I think about this. I cannot disclose any information. I can't disclose any information that will hurt my client. So if my client needs to move to Atlanta for a job and they got to be there within 30 days and they need the money for this house to sell, I can disclose that to the buyer. 
that could potentially hurt my client, right? I'd be breaking the care piece. So I'm not allowed to disclose any, uh, any confidential information. Now, disclosure looks like this. Disclosure is I have to disclose any material defects that I know about the property as the seller or as the, the, the buyer's agent to my client, right? So if I represent the buyer, any material defects that I know, I have to let them know. Well, let's talk about with them as like working for the seller. And I find out that the buyer just lost their job. I must disclose that information to my client. All right. So that's what disclosure looks like. Like if I'm on the buy side and I know bad things that are with the property, I have to disclose to my buyer. If I'm on the sell side of things and I find out bad information about the buyer, I actually have to disclose it to my seller. Loyalty, again, like I'm here to make my client win. I am here to, to go to battle for them. And as long as they're not asking me to break the law or do anything illegal, I owe them loyalty, which means like if this house makes sense for them, that's the house that I'm going to show them and fight for them to win. If this house over here, I'm going to make more money in a commission check. That's not the house that I'm fighting for, right? Like if this doesn't make sense for them, I'm not fighting for this house. I'm fighting for the house that makes sense for their needs. And then obedience, right? Again, like as long as they're going through and they're not telling me to do anything illegal, I am going to do it, right? And this is where that vicarious liability piece comes into play, right? Like a couple of things. They tell me to do something illegal and I do something illegal. Well, they're going to get a lawsuit probably just as quick as me. And then vicarious liability, like if I were to do something, like I accidentally hit someone with my car, my client isn't going to get sued, right? I might get sued, but my client just because I'm working for them won't get sued. So these are your six fiduciary duties. Think about it as AC, cold, right? Accounting, care, confidentiality, obedience, loyalty, and disclosure. And so on the exam, I'm probably just remember fiduciary AC cold. And with that acronym that I have, if something pops up and it says, which one of these are not a fiduciary responsibility for an agent, and most likely they're going to give you something that doesn't start with one of these letters that so doesn't fit in the acronym AC cold, that's going to be what I'm going to be like, oh, that thing, that thing's not part of my fiduciary responsibilities. Now, what do I owe a customer? And guys, I want you to keep this in mind. A customer could also be the third party to a transaction. All right. So the third party to a transaction, if I represent the seller, would be the buyer who is being represented by the buyer's agent. Or if I represent the buyer, it could be the seller who's represented by the seller's agent. Or if I represent the seller and someone walks in off the street also customer or third party to the transaction. They're the exact same thing when it comes to these questions. So third party to the transaction or customer, I want you to go into the exact same mindset. I owe them fair and honest dealings, which all that means is I can't lie to them. All right. Like do not lie. I have to go through and give reasonable care. So like I can provide paperwork. I'm not going to ask them and, and, and strategize with them. But as long as I'm not doing anything to hurt my client, that is care, that is reasonable care and diligence. Like I might go to them and be like, hey, the date and deadline is coming up. Is there anything you want to do? Now, if they ask me for any advice, like, no, 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 I can't do that. And I should still go through and say, hey, like, this is about to happen. Does your client want to do anything? And Disclosure material facts. Again, right? The disclosure means that if that there's a crack on the foundation, I have to disclose it. Or if I know that the other party has done something which will impact the, um, the transaction, I have to let my client know, right? So disclosure to a customer, again, is something that we have to do. Disclosure material facts, reasonable care, fair and honest dealings, that is what we owe a customer or third party to the transaction. So now we're to the end, right? Like we're looking at the, the contract, the agency relationship can be terminated. All right. So the agency relationship is over. So completion or performance, like I help them find one, two, three main street. I help them sell one, two, three main street. 
the agency agreement's over, mutual agreement, like they don't want to work with me anymore. I don't want to work with them anymore. We can let each other out of the contract. The expiration of a contract, right? Like we know that all contracts have to have a definite start date and a definite end date. And if we hit that definite end date, the contract's over. The death of our client or principal or the agent. I really want you guys to think more of the broker, right? Because we're designated agents. But if the broker dies, then the relationship will end. And then obviously, like if I represent the, the, the listing side of things and the house burns down, then the relationship will end as well. So these are how a contract can come to conclusion is one of these items as far as agency goes. All right, so now we're to the practice of real estate. This is our third topic and our last topic of the day. And when we're going through, these are gonna be important things to keep in mind. Again, like all three of these things are north of 30% of your national exam and some of them cross back over into the state exam for Colorado. So antitrust laws. So we have Sherman antitrust laws, which forbid a couple different things, price fixing, group boycotting, and market allegation and tying arrangements. So when we look at this thing, let's talk about price fixing. And this is when we have multiple agents go in and they say, guys, look, we own this market. And if we all got together and we said that our new commission rate was 10% and we all stuck to it, the consumers would have to pay 10% because we do most of the business and where else are they going to go? So you're going to get a test question. The test question goes like, you walk into a room and the, the, the agents are talking about commission rates. What should you do? The answers immediately walk out. Like as this is a super big deal and you can see at the very bottom of the screen how big of a deal it really is. Um, this happens, you walk into a room, you immediately walk out of this room. You do not pass go on this thing. Like you, you run out. Then we have group, group boycotting, right? So this is like, maybe there's like two, three brokers and they're like, you know what? We hate this other brokerage. And what we should do is not show any of their properties. We're not going to show any of this other brokerage's properties because we don't like them. That is group boycotting, and that is also illegal. Another thing is allocation of markets. And I would say, like, the easiest way for me to remember this is let's just say, like, we have, like, different ethnicities of brokerages, and we're like, awesome. So you get that, that part of town because that's where this ethnic group lives. And you get this part of town because that's where this ethnic group lives. If brokerages and brokers are dividing markets based that way, that is against the law. And then tying yeah. arrangements, right? And so this is where um, I like just the example, right? It says, for instance, if a real estate broker owns 10 acres of land that a builder wants to buy, the broker will only sell it to the builder if they list the property with the brokerage firm. Like That's against the law. If I'm selling the property, I have to sell the property. I can't say like, you have to use me when you're going to buy the property or sell the property in the future, right? That's a tying arrangement and that is against the law to do. So those are the four different antitrust laws that you will need to remember for the exam. And I don't know if you're going to get a test question around this. I think like someone is going to get unlucky and get like the actual dollar amount, but it's a hundred thousand dollar fine, three years in prison, all the way up for a corporation that can get hit for a million dollars. Like if the whole brokerage is doing this thing, that's a million dollar fine. If it's an agent, it's up to a hundred thousand dollars. And again, like if it goes to a civil case, most everything, and we all know this is it could be up to three times the uh, the value, and you would have to pay attorney fees and cost as well. So, uh, you know, when you look at the PSI um, manual, the candidate bulletin, it does say that you should know this dollar amount and the, the fines that go around it. I'm not, I can't say that I've ever heard anyone getting this thing, 
but I would absolutely make sure that I know price fixing, antitrust, market allocation, and tie-in arrangements for the Sherman antitrust laws. You're also going to have to know, you know, the difference between independent contractor and employee. And so basically, this is what I like to think about when we're going down these pieces. When we're talking about an independent contractor, we cannot require them to work, work set hours. We cannot require them to perform services at a specific location. We cannot require them to make, meet, meet at and make staff meetings. We cannot make them train um, and we cannot like give them stuff that says like, these are what you have to use and these are your material, right? Like those are the things that we cannot do. So if anyone goes through and they say, hey, look, these are your hours, you're expected to be here, this is when you're supposed to work, and this is where we expect you to be when you're working, you're not an independent contractor, you're an employee at that point. You're a W-2, you're no longer a 1099. And one of the big things is when you're a 1099, when you're an independent contractor, the brokerage does not hold back your taxes, right? So you will be responsible for paying your federal and state income taxes. So that's why I look at hours, mandatory, right? Like if there's mandatory anything, I'm no longer a 1099. I'm no longer an independent contractor. I am an employee and federal and state income. So if you get a test question around these, like these are the things that you want to look at. These are the things that make you an independent contractor versus a uh, W-2 employee. Also, guys, when we start thinking about this, you're going to get some fair housing questions. And let's just think about like advertising and marketing, right? And everything that we go through, whether it is Facebook, the newspaper, billboards, if we're putting stuff out there that alludes that like this is our ideal client or this is someone that shouldn't be here, it's against the law. That is a federal fair housing violation, right? So if you're doing, and this is the thing that it's like, if you're going through and you're putting like predominantly like white advertising around like a church and a house, like you're, I mean, that's, that's religion and race, right? Right there. And so you have to be very cognizant of a lot of the things that you're doing. Or if you go through, right? Even says like examples down here, if you come out and just straight say, no, no children and no people in wheelchairs. Either one, right? Like if your advertising is pushing an agenda through, it's like marketing to make it look like this is your ideal person. Or if you're coming out and just straight saying like these people should not apply, both of those. And so when we start thinking about uh, federal fair housing, it is race, color, religion, sex, disability, familial status, and national origin. If you were doing anything that says like one of these people should not apply, one of these people is not allowed, one of these people, right? 100% against the law. And when we go into this thing, the, the last thing that I really want to touch is redlining, blockbusting, and steering. And so redlining guys like this actually used to be like either figurative or literal. Like these guys would go through and they would just circle on a map and says, awesome. This group that lives in this neighborhood is this ethnic race. And though that ethnic race, we don't want to loan money to them because property values go down or they typically default or insert whatever here. That's redlining. It is against the law and is around funding. All right. This is around banking. Like the banks would say, like, we're not going to loan any money to this area because this type of people lives there and we are not going to give them money to buy a house. 100% against the law. Steering. This is where, like, you go through and you're telling someone that maybe they don't want to live in this area because this type of person lives there and they don't look like this type of person. Or you say, hey, you don't want to live there because your people don't live there. You probably want to live over here. 
either one of those is against the law. And again, this is racial, racially determined, right? This is this is around a lot around the, the color of people's skin. All right. So that is steering. Steering is when I say, hey, you don't want to live in that area because your people don't live there. Or, hey, you might want to live in this area because those people, your people do live there. That is steering and it's against the law. The other one is called blockbusting. They also might call it panic selling or they might call it panic peddling, right? You're going to have to know all three of those because if you get a question, it actually might not be, um, they might not call it blockbusting. They might call it panic selling. And they're going to say, you know, which one of these is not around um, around the same category, right? Where they're going redlining, steering, blockbusting. And they might replace blockbusting with panic selling and throw something random in there. Like which one of these is not against the law? Well, this looks like is this. This is like when I go into um, someone's neighborhood. I'm like, hey, I don't know if you've noticed, but this type of person, this ethnic group is starting to move into your neighborhood. And you know what happens when that ethnic group moves in is that the value of the home start to go down. And so you might want to sell today before anyone else realizes that they're moving in. That's panic selling. That is blockbusting. Again, 100% against the law. Like you cannot go into a neighborhood and to incite fear because of an ethnic group is moving into the neighborhood and you need them to sell their house so they don't lose any money, right? Like, all three of these things, a hundred percent against the law. And you need to make sure that you understand all three of these for the exam. Mm 